looks good. How did I guess tonight? Almost. There it is. Red light. There we go. Good evening. Welcome to Anchor Church. I'm Pastor Rocket. All of y'all are Anchor, Ch Anchor Church, whether you're in here or whether you're in there in that little electronic box. That is still, one day I will get used to that. I've just had to ignore it. I'm still not used to it. <laughs> I'm glad you're with us this evening. Welcome. I hope that you were uh, able to see this morning's message. If you're part of our church, it's important whether you're online or here. Um, it's uh, one of the few times that I'll say, look, you need to go check out that message um, because I feel like we heard from the Lord this morning. I hope it wasn't just me. Um, but if the responses we got from the folks that were here in person and the fact that we had as many views on it as we have already, it's only been online for a couple of hours and uh, there were 15 views on it when I looked this evening and that's probably the fastest growing view count that we've had because even on really good videos, we get maybe 60, 70 views on something. So to have that many in the first couple hours is exciting. But anyway, that's a different message, but go check that one out. Tonight we've got the second part of a series that we started last week um, about discipleship. Jesus makes five if-then statements in the course of Scripture, and we looked at the first two of those last week. But before we get into that review and start tonight, I'm going to go ahead and pray. Uh, if you want to go ahead and look up the first reference we're going to look at tonight, you can go to, go to the book of Luke. Um, all of the references we'll use, at least for the main points, are going to come out of Luke. The first one's going to be Luke chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. So you can go ahead and look that one up. I'm going to pray. We're going to get going. Lord, we thank you this evening for the chance to come together and be in your house. I thank you for the great work that you're doing here in the lives of your people. I thank you for the work that you're doing in all of us that are gathered in your name, no matter how we are gathering right now. I thank you for the words that you've been delivering to us here in your house and the promises you've made us. And I thank you for the work that you're going to do to complete them in us and through us in the days to come. Be with us tonight as we continue this study on discipleship and the five statements you've made about how to know if we're disciples. Let me speak well and speak clearly. Let your purpose be accomplished and let us hear and receive what you would have for us. And most importantly, apply it and put it into practice so that your work can be done on the earth. In your name we pray. Amen. So, Jesus makes five statements we talked about last week. If then. If you do this, then we will know that you are my disciple. He's pretty clear and he's pretty plain about what those things are. And last week we looked at two of them. And we looked at them in the context of first we actually went through a, uh, we went through an article that I found online about seven things that people outside the church say about Christians. It was not favorable. And we said, you know, for lack of better terminology, the church, the people in it need a makeover because we have done a poor job of representing Christ to people who don't know him. And in order to address that, we started looking at these statements, and we said if all of us would live according to these five things that Jesus said are identifying characteristics of true disciples of Christ, it would change the concept of who we are, and it would change the world around us. The first one we looked at was John 13, 34, and 35. If you will love one another, you can disagree with people without, without having to be disrespectful. You can still be kind, and most importantly, we knew in that one Jesus is talking to people in the church. Y'all stop fighting with each other. I don't care if you're Baptist or Methodist or Church of God or Independence or what you are. Let's not drag our family discussions out into public. We've got to love one another even when we disagree. The second one we looked at last week, if you continue in God's word, people will know you are my disciple. Read and pray, read and pray, read and pray, and accomplish the word with the same attitude that Jesus did. Live it the same way Jesus did, not just in the temple and not just when people are watching, and you can tell. Live it that way all the time. Continue in his word. It's a constant process. This week, we're going to look at number three. It comes out of Luke chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. Then he said to them all, Jesus is speaking to a group of people that are following him, and he turns around and he says this to the whole group. He left nobody out. This was not just for a specific group of people. It was not just for the disciples. It was not even just for the Christians, because number one, Christians didn't exist yet by the definition we have today. And number two, these people were still learning about Jesus, and some of them had not even begun to follow him routinely yet. yet. This is broad spectrum for everybody. He said to them all, if anyone wants to be my disciple, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to have his life will, or to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me will save it. If we could condense that down to this if-then statement that all of these work around, it's if anyone wants to be my disciple. If you want to be my disciple, you must deny yourself. 
if you're going to be my disciple, then you will deny yourself. This is obviously a statement about identity. What, Pastor? You've already preached about identity. Are you going to do this again? Yes, because it's exactly what this means. This is a statement about identity. That word deny that Jesus uses here, Jesus' word, not my word, not Luke's word, not somebody else's word, the word of the Son of God for deny that he uses here literally means refuse to identify with. This is an identity question. Another way that this gets interpreted sometimes means to disown what you previously thought about yourself. No matter which definition you use, we're talking about identity. How do I see me? How do I want others to see me? What is it that defines me? Jesus says, if anyone wants to be my disciple, deny or refuse to identify with myself. Something important we've got to know tonight out of this, if we're going to be disciples of Jesus, as we have to understand my identity is not about my choice in anything. I do not choose who and what I am if I have become a disciple. We make the mistake far too often of saying, I have chosen Christ. I believe that's a well-intended statement, and I don't want to split hairs over vocabulary, but you did not choose Christ over your sin. You did not choose Christ over your preferences. You did not choose Christ over your desires, because that's not how faith works. Christ chose you. You responded to his selection and his extension of an invitation to you. We make that mistake, but here's the thing. The problem with that is very similar to something we looked at in the message this morning. That statement still makes the focus me. I chose, as if I did God some favor. I chose God over what I would prefer, over what I like, over what is natural for me. I don't get to be the center of anything where Christ is part of the discussion. I'm not even on the table. So for me to say I chose Christ puts the focus in the wrong place. You can't continue to identify yourself with a thing that God has delivered you from. If you've got an addiction or a sexual preference or a mental illness that used to be your identity and you're trying to say I picked God instead of that thing, the problem is that I'm still identified with what I used to be and I say I chose God instead of that. This is who I actually am, but I picked him. There's a problem because I'm still at the middle of that. I'm going to show you this. In Ephesians 1, 4, Scripture says God chose you. It says, for he chose us. That's as plain as it gets. Ephesians 1, 4, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. This is not a recent development. The Lord did not just recently decide to pick you. You did not come to your moment of salvation because the Lord decided that today is the day I'm going to let him know or her know that I like him, that I love him, that I want them to be part of what's going on in my life. That's not how it works. He chose us before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight in love. That's as clear as it's going to get. Your identity is not the result of your abuse or your illness or your preferences. If you are in Christ, your identity is what he gave you when you entered the relationship with him. Who you are came from him. It wasn't a choice that you made. It's not even a choice you're afforded the opportunity to make. The Lord chose you and identified you well what identity did he give me i'm glad that you asked that to be holy and blameless in his sight in love he says it right there he chose you before the foundation of the earth to be holy and blameless how in the world can you do that news flash if you're paying attention this morning you already know the answer but in case you weren't here today and haven't seen that yet how do i accomplish being holy and blameless i cannot i need the holy spirit to do it the Lord has chosen me to be this thing, and I have got to take what I used to be and sit it completely aside and refuse to identify with it any longer so that I can receive the Holy Spirit and he can then empower me to be identified with what God said I am, holy and blameless in the sight of God because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and the power of his spirit alive in me. Gosh, it's hard to say some of this stuff sitting down and trying to teach. <laughs> The Lord has given you an identity as someone who is holy and blameless. You can't choose to be holy and blameless. You can't. 
I would challenge you just as an experiment if you think you're capable to try and live in a way that is holy for one day. One day. Live completely holy. Don't have a bad thought. Don't have something you have to apologize for. Don't have something anyone could call into question. Don't watch anything. Don't listen to anything. Don't spend any time with anything. Don't read anything. Don't give yourself over in any way to something that is less than God's perfect will. Try it for one day. Not even 24 hours because you're going to sleep for about eight of those. Just while you're awake, give it a shot. You can't do it because the word holy is not even in my natural vocabulary. I don't wake up as a human being and, Im and immediately think I need to be holy. Humans didn't even come up with that word. That's God's word because it defines the difference between him and me. We like to say that God is ultimately a God of love, but God is a holy God. His love comes out of his holiness. We talked about the nature of God being a father, but the nature is different than the actual essence. God is a holy God who loves us, and his feelings and of nurture and fatherhood come out of the fact that I am holy and perfect, and I need to lead and bring and pull along and cover and make something out of this, my children, that they are not. I use my nature to produce holiness. I use my love to produce holiness, but holiness is what God is. It's the thing that separates him from me, and it's the thing that I can't accomplish myself even if I can pull off the whole love everybody and be nice to everybody and be a good person. I need the Holy Spirit to do this thing because holy is God's word, not mine. It's his concept, not mine, and it's the very thing that makes him different. So if my identity is tied to Christ, if my identity is that he has chosen me to be holy and blameless and I can't do it without the Holy Spirit, a change has got to happen in me. And at the end of the day, I am still going to be a human being stuck in this body. And the enemy is going to continue to tempt me to do the things that I used to do. It's very interesting that Jesus, I, I, there's not a word that he ever spoke that was just in vain or that was just a filler word. We say things like, um, or I think, or we repeat ourselves. And Jesus said everything with purpose. And even in this passage, he says, do this daily. Why? Because he knows the enemy is going to keep coming. Take up your cross daily. And he used, he said, take up your cross. He did not say, take up the corpse of who you were because God does not want to spend your life reminding you of what you were and what you did. He wants to remind you of the instrument of your salvation. Wake up every day and pick up your cross, pick up the salvation, pick up the identity that you have in Christ, forgetting and leaving behind what died on it. We have to remind ourselves daily that God has defined me as a different person and a different creature with a different person because of the action of the death and resurrection of his son. The salvation and the redemption that came from that is what I need to be reminded of daily. I can't identify with. He says, deny, refuse. That's not part of me anymore. We know the enemy likes to deal in territory and authority. You think about warfare when we're talking about one country coming against another. We want to defeat your ideas, and we want to take your land, and we want what belongs to you to be under our control. The enemy looks at you, and he wants to gain ground, and he wants to gain control in your life. And generally speaking, the easiest way to do that is to try and attack you somewhere that you have failed before. When you look at something and go, this worked last time, I'm going to try it again, that's the most logical approach. Generally speaking, you don't, you, we have a phrase as human beings, we say, you don't need to reinvent the wheel, somebody knows how to make this work, right? The enemy would do the same thing. Last time what worked was porn. Last time what worked was stealing. Last time what worked was pride. Last time what worked, let's try that again because it's familiar. And it works. It's proven over time. And the enemy will come back and try again and again to take territory and authority in a way that has proven to be successful. And that's why the Lord says we've got to continue to take up the cross daily. Remember who we are, not who we were. Because if I'm still identifying with I would rather do this, but I'm doing some great service for the Lord. If I have a day that I don't feel like serving the Lord, what I really want to be is what I'm going to do. That's got to die, and I have to take up the cross that says this is the symbol of the change, that I am someone else. I am someone new. There's a scripture in the past or in, in the Bible that even speaks about generational curses. I don't have time to teach this tonight. Maybe sometime we will. I got a feeling we're going to get into some more spirit stuff as we're going along. 
not this evening ago. Generational curses, the idea of the sins of the father being visited upon the children. We even know this as a natural concept as human beings. We look at things and go, uh, well, you know, his daddy was an alcoholic. Good chance he's going to be an alcoholic. His mom was crazy. Good chance he's going to be crazy. His parents were X, so there's a good chance that the kids are going to be X. We just kind of accept that because they've been brought up in an environment or they just have the same tendencies because it's the same blood. We say that about families. Oh, well, you know, he's a barber and we know how the barbers act. So that's just what you can expect. There he is being one again. Scripture speaks of that. And it's it's true because the enemy will sometimes look at things and go, "Okay, I couldn't get the father to fall. But in his past, he had this issue before he met the Lord. If we were able to snare the father with this, perhaps we can get the children. Spirit, the spirit of the enemy even remembers. And he says, if that thing is not severed and defeated completely in me, it may seek to visit my children. And if you extend that concept even further, if you're looking at yourself as a leader in the church, and I don't mean a leader in the church because you're a pastor or have a title. I mean because you're a disciple that's following after the Lord and you're actually building and expanding the kingdom. We need to be aware that the people that are following us could even fall prey to this sort of thing because if the leader or the mentor or the rabbi has this weakness, if they're not careful, they will build that weakness into those that are following them. And so if the father was into that spiritually, perhaps the spiritual children will be too. The Lord says, guard your hearts. When we enter into a relationship with Christ, we are severing the ties that we had with those things, and we can't revisit them. He says, deny yourself. It doesn't mean to suffer. It doesn't mean I want a Snickers bar so bad and I shouldn't get one. If you talk to nutritionists and people that talk about making your body better and talk about being healthy, they'll tell you it's better to just go ahead and eat the Snickers bar and be prepared to do the work to get rid of it. Because denying yourself in a way that is unhealthy is just going to make it worse. I watched a guy that, uh, that does this for a living the other day, and he says, look, you got a Snickers bar sitting on the counter, and you want it, and you know that's 260 calories, but I shouldn't eat that, so maybe if I eat a banana, now you've eaten a banana and you still want the Snickers bar, so now I'm going to go try something else. And then three or four things down the road, you find out now I've given in and I ate the Snickers bar anyway, and I've also added another 500 calories to it. Denying myself apart from the power of God, is actually going to weaken and make me worse and probably lead me into a deeper and darker place. I've got to make sure my desire for the thing was severed and I've actually accepted the identity with Christ. I'm not just preferring the Lord. I have been changed, and I am not the man that wanted what I wanted before. We enter into the relationship and we sever the ties with those things. And who we are no longer is that thing we're not making some great sacrifice for the lord and even if we were trying to make some great sacrifice for the lord we we find ourselves in this place where we would say oh look at the great thing i've done i have done without the problem with some of these programs like aa or na they're great and they bring a lot of people out of addiction issues but all of a sudden we say, I got my one-year chip, my two-year chip, my three-year chip. Suddenly it's look what I did and look how far I've gotten and where's the Lord in it? Because if he's not, you haven't changed. You're still measuring your life by the thing that destroyed you. And we need to measure our life by the thing that saved us. Deny yourself. You're not doing the Lord some great favor by choosing him. You're accepting who he says you are and letting him take center stage in your life. You have to deny the self you once knew. If you look at Galatians 19, uh, uh, oh gosh, I forgot to put the chapter in here. <laughs> it's in Galatians verse 19 and 20, and I forgot the chapter, and I'm sorry, I don't know it off my head. I should. Matter of fact, I'm going to look it up. Bear with me, because I don't like not having the scripture reference. I, it drives me nuts when people say, oh, the Bible says. The great thing about the internet. Thank you for your patience. Galatians 2, 19 and 20, okay? Galatians chapter 2, 19 and 20. It says, and you probably know this, it is no longer I that lives, but Christ who lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It is no longer I living. I have no ties to that person anymore because that corpse is dead. It is Christ living in me, and that's my identity. 
now and I still live a life it says the life I now live in this body I still live in this body but the spirit that's driving it is not the one that calls this body to do terrible things anymore the spirit that's driving it is one that will cause me to grow and expand and make the Lord great upon the earth when we attempt to save who we once were we will find out that it will kill us the life I live in the body If I continue to identify with the body, it will die because this is not forever. This is going to rot. This will be food for worms, ladies and gentlemen. Attempting to save and preserve who I was that was part of a dead and dying generation means that I will die. But the life I now live, see, we, we focus on what we used to be. And the issue with that is it only gets us to the cross, but not through it. It will bring us to the point that, okay, perhaps something gets crucified and tortured and dies, but if we don't move past the cross, we're just in a process of failing and then coming back and dying and failing and coming back and dying and failing and coming back and dying. In resurrection, we should become like Christ who lives forever. In resurrection, we become a new creature that has a place in eternity, and we didn't have that before. We had a life that was destined for death and hell and destruction. In resurrection, we become like Christ and we become victorious over the thing that once destined us to fail. We become victorious over that thing that once polluted us and tormented us. And we are no longer like that because that person is dead. The life I live in this body, I now live with complete and total faith in who God says I am. Not in what my addictions were, not in what my failures were, not in what people told me I was going to be. God chose me and God identified me. This is what he means when he says deny yourself. The only choice that we make in our identity if we say we're disciples of Christ is to receive who he says we are. He, may, he, he extended to us a gift. He's provided for us a purpose. There's an identification that he established before the foundations of the earth and it's been extended the whole time. We aren't choosing Christ, we're simply accepting what he intended from day one, and we're doing it on his terms. And from now on, it's his name stamped on me, not mine. And when we fully accept Christ, we will cease to center our life around what my preferences are, and I'll instead accept the identity and the purpose of the kingdom of God for my life. If you wish to be my disciple, deny yourself. So we've seen three of these. Gosh, I want to keep going. We're going to go we're going to go one more, but I could keep preaching that one for a while. If you love one another, people will know you're my disciple. If you continue in God's word, people will know you're my disciple. If you deny yourself, then you are my disciple. The fourth statement that Jesus makes that identifies disciple is found in Luke chapter 14 verse 26. If you want to turn just those few pages, I'll give you a moment to get there. Luke 14:26. It reads like this. Jesus is speaking again. He says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. If you love God above all else, then you are a disciple. This statement, the way Jesus makes it, is a very bold and disturbing one, though, to say, Hate your mother and father Hate your wife and your children. Hate your brothers and sisters. Hate yourself. Wait a minute. Didn't you just tell me that God told me how great he decided I should be? Didn't he just give me an identity that's a wonderful thing in him? Yes, he did. We have to understand what Jesus is saying here. This is a Bible study, and I'm going to try to teach and not just preach the whole night. We have to have a little bit of an understanding of culture and language here. Throughout Scripture... God, and even Jesus while he's walking on the earth, has spoken about the importance of family. We talked about it a little bit tonight. I've referenced it once already. God's nature is that of a father. God sends Jesus and says, this is my son. God defines the role of family members in the Garden of Eden when he says he gave woman to man, and this is how they should behave, and called them a family. God tells us that true ministry is to care for orphans and widows. You know who those are? Those are people without family because family is important and they need someone to fill that role when they don't have one because family matters so much. The family relationship is central to Scripture. 
And if you've been with me as we've taught taught our way through the, the gospel of John, John, we talked about what a big deal it was for him to leave his family as a teenage boy when he's supposed to be staying home and learning the family business from the time that his education as a good Hebrew is over to the time he turns 30. Then he's an adult. Then he's supposed to take care of his parents and continue the family business. And he bailed on all that to follow Jesus. And we talked about what a big deal culturally that was. It would have been disgraceful as far as the neighbors were concerned. We need to understand when Jesus makes this statement, he is, he is not turning this idea of the importance of family on its head. He's not suddenly saying, forget everything that I told you about family. Like a lot of other words, there's more than one word for hate in the language that Jesus would have used. There's one word for hate that describes how God feels about sin. And it's a word that means to detest, to be turned against, or to be reviled by. The Lord is absolutely repulsed by sin. And I've taught about this and preached about this several times recently when we say the law still applies. Jesus just fulfilled the consequences, but God does not hate sin any less today than he ever has in all the time sin has been a thing. That's one word, but that's not the word that Jesus uses. Jesus uses a different word for hate that is a word of comparison. The word Jesus used means to love something less. Jesus is making a point about how much we must love the Lord, not about stopping our love for family and people. It's a statement of comparison, not about an absolute practice. In fact, the way Jesus uses this word, because it says you have to love something more, he's acknowledging the importance of loving your family and saying, of all the things that you love, this should be the most important one except for the Lord. The statement that Jesus makes here is, in fact, it's got no teeth and it's got, it's got no bite and it's got no power whatsoever if we don't acknowledge the importance of loving and caring for family and what a big deal that would have been to people. We have to understand what the family dynamic is to hear what Jesus is truly saying here. We've got to understand, you know, the father in the household represents God the father. If I'm not a good dad to my kids, how are they going to know to accept the Lord as their father? By extension, we have to recognize that the family and the unity that is happening in a functioning godly family unit is the thing that most closely mirrors the relationship that we have with God and what we call the family of God. You remember that old Gaither song? I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I wish I was a better singer. They were great at it. We call it the family of God, and there's a reason for that. Because it functions the same way that a properly aligned household should. It's the best picture of the relationship with him that we're supposed to have that we can see with our own eyes. A household in proper godly order is the very picture of what God says should look like, or the church and the people in it should look like. Paul addresses that when he talks about leadership in 1 Timothy. We've studied this quite a while ago. Um, we studied leadership here on a Wednesday night before we were even putting things online. Um, so maybe we need to do that again. 1 Timothy 3, the first four verses read like this. If anyone aspires to be a leader, he desires a noble work. A leader, therefore, must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, self-controlled, sensible, respectable, hospitable, a good teacher, not addicted to wine, not a bully, not quarrelsome, not greedy, one who manages his household competently and has his children under control with all dignity. That's the picture of what church leadership is supposed to look like. Why? Because that's the picture of how God would lead us. There are all kinds of other passages in Scripture that just continually pile on references to how important family is and why it matters is because it looks like the relationship we should have with the Lord. There's the passage. There's a lot of these in Ephesians. Wives, submit to your husbands. That's Ephesians 5.22. Children, obey your parents. That's Ephesians 6.1. Fathers, don't provoke your children. Ephesians 6.4. There are Scriptures, multiple Scriptures, that address the church as the bride of Christ. One of my favorites is 2 Corinthians 11.2, if you want to just write that down and look it up later. But there are dozens dozens of them the family unit matters and there's a reason that the enemy wants to destroy the picture that we have of family there's a reason that he wants to destroy the institution of family and of marriage and of relationship as far as families are concerned where it's because it's defined in scripture as a way that mirrors what the kingdom is supposed to look like and if he can dismantle the family he can dismantle the greatest picture of the design god has for that kingdom 
And Jesus acknowledges every bit of that and how important it is in this statement that he makes. And we can't forget this part. You know, yes, you even have to get to the point that you hate yourself, but he doesn't mean dislike me, be hard on me, think I'm a terrible person, speak poorly of me. He doesn't mean run yourself down and have a bad opinion of you. We just learn from that verse in Luke 9, 23, that our identity and value come from God, and we can't hate what comes from him because everything that comes from his is good. We know that from James 1, 7, everything that's good comes from God. Jesus makes this statement about disciples, and he says, unless you hate these people. And the reason the statement is so powerful is because he says, I acknowledge how great and how important these things are. But you must love God even more than that. Just as a side note, something else that's interesting, that word for hate that means just to love something less, when Jesus applies it to other things and when it's used in other places in Scripture by guys like Paul and guys like John and guys like all the, all the, the writers from the gospel, matter of fact, even a lot of the Old Testament writers use this word for hate that Jesus used here. So when you go into Scripture and you start reading verses that talk about hating your enemies, it doesn't mean detest them and wish horrible things upon them. It means simply love them less but you still have to love them because it's just not as much. Ouch. Not in the notes, but I try to listen to the Lord. Jesus acknowledges every bit of the kind of love that we're supposed to have. And he takes the thing that in Scripture mirrors the relationship we should have with the Father and is the very picture of what the kingdom should be. And he says as important as all of that is, the love you have for your God must be greater than that. In the same way that we deny ourselves when we're given the option. A disciple will follow Christ no matter what the cost of following him might be. Sometimes the cost of that is even the dislike or the disrespect or the misunderstanding of the people that are closest to you that you're supposed to love the most of all apart from him. Jesus says, if you're my disciple, you'll still love God more than anything else. So we have these four statements so far. If you love one another, people will know you're my disciple. If you continue in God's word, people will know that you're my disciple. If you deny yourself, then people will know you're my disciple. And if you love God more than anything else, people will know you're my disciple. And the remainder of this we find in the next two verses of Luke 14, Luke 14, 27 and 28, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you wanting to build a tower doesn't sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? And Jesus continues, and I'll summarize here to essentially say, people will make fun of you if you start something and don't finish. The last statement that Jesus makes, they will know you're my disciple if you value me more than you value your own pride. Probably the hardest one because we don't like to think of ourselves as prideful or arrogant. And in fact, we can probably, as individuals, lay out a long list in front of anyone that called us that horrible thing and tell them exactly why we're not proud and arrogant. And you know what that accomplishes? We look even more prideful and arrogant because we have a big list of all the reasons that I'm not proud. I have a joke uh, with a couple of different friends of mine, but it started with uh, someone who's a member of this church. I've got a, I'm the most humble person I know. There's not anybody more humble than me. In fact, if there was a humble contest, I would win. I've entered a couple of humble contests, and I've got a four-foot-tall humble trophy in my office. It's in a glass case. I've got lights that shine on it, so it's the first thing everybody sees when they come in so they'll know how humble I am. Do you hear how silly that is? It's absolutely absurd. That's what you sound like when you say, I'm not prideful. Here's all the reasons I'm not full of pride. Jesus says, if you don't bear your own cross and come after me, you can't be my disciple. Well, we heard, we heard that already. 
But he says, which of you wanting to build a tower doesn't sit down first and calculate the cost? See, this one dovetails because it's just right there with the one we just talked about. We talked about loving Jesus more than anything else. And sometimes loving him more than anything else means the people closest to you will not understand what you're doing. And I'm going to have to get over myself and not care what those people around me think in stepping out and doing what God's asked me to do. Because what the Lord has asked me to do is more valuable than what people think of me. What the Lord has asked me to do is more valuable and more important than whether I look like an idiot on TV or on the Internet or if my family respects and loves what I'm doing. I've told you a lot of times about myself and my own life. I've, I've tried to get better about using just myself as an example when I talk to you. I, I have family members. I have friends. And please do not hear this as me bragging, but I have been in some places and walked on some stages and worked with some people and they have looked at what I'm doing here in this small town, in this small church with a small congregation, and they said, why would you do that when you've been here and done this? And they, they, they say, I, I've had one who is, he's a Church of God minister, and I love this man so much. He has been a great encouragement to me. But he looked at me once, and he says, how long are you going to slave away over there before you'll step into something like what God really has for you? And he's well-intended. He's not being unkind, but he doesn't understand completely and thoroughly what I'm doing with my life and these are people that I love and care about and that I know love and care about me and I've had to learn this particular point this particular piece really since I've been here more than I ever have at any other point in my life I know this looks foolish to you family I know this looks foolish to you friends I know looks, this looks foolish to you, even mentors and people I love and respect. And even though I realize from the tone in your voice and the way that you slant your eyes and the way that you tilt your head, I can tell you don't approve and this is not what you think I should be doing, but I know I'm following the Lord. And I care so much more about what he's going to do here. And I didn't move here and come here to do this because I wanted people to think I had done something great. It's probably the biggest risk that I've ever taken in my life when I said I'm going to follow the Lord even though it doesn't make sense. The bearing your own cross part, okay, I've got to identify myself with Christ. The love God more than you love anything else, well, we all have to work on that one. Love one another. Some of us do that better than others. Deny yourself. Find your identity in Christ. Continue in God's word. Read and pray. To some degree, those first four things are a whole lot easier than this last one because this last one actually affects me personally. And I don't mean just me as an individual. I mean anyone who calls themselves a disciple. Learning to not think so highly of myself is one of the hardest things that I can do because some of us that have struggled through that thing of deny yourself and have found our identity in Christ have even held on to that so strongly and said, I was worthless and nobody and a wreck and a disaster and I found the Lord and he made something great out of me. And then even after the Lord has built that back up and I have found that identity in him, I still have to realize that even the greatest thing that I feel like I've accomplished my salvation in him and the ministry that he might have built through me and the relationships that have come as a result of me picking up my cross. I have to care more about how I look to him than even I care about whether people think I'm doing a good job of being identified with him or not. It's the weirdest paradox in the world because Christians are the only people that shoot their wounded and we will look at someone stepping out in faith and we will be quick to tell them what they're doing wrong and we will be quick to tell them, oh, I don't think that the Lord's in that and you are crazy to go do it. And as Christians, we want so much to hang on to and we have to realize my identity is in him. But if I'm holding too close to what God did before and in the past and what I've seen him do, I can very quickly close the door on the future that he has for me. My personal pride dying, even when my pride, I'm trying to root it in him, is one of the hardest things to learn. But if we don't, he says, you cannot be my disciple. Sit down and count the cost and realize at the end of the day, no one may know your name. No one may sing your praises. No one may remember a thing about you. Because if we've done it right, at the end of the day, people will say, I see the Lord in what got done. I see the Lord seated on his throne 
there in that place with those people, with that family. You know, a lot of people don't even hear the good things that others will say about them because they get said at their funeral. Some of the best things people will ever say about you will get said after you're gone. Because a lot of people won't even realize what great things you did for the Lord or otherwise until you're not there doing them anymore. And the Lord says, if you're going to do my work, value me and value eternity more than you value how people see you. They may see your work when you're gone, and that would be great. But what's most important is that the Lord gets the glory for everything. We want to be disciples of Christ, and we have to have the whole picture. These are the five things that Jesus himself said. If you do these, then you're my disciple. Love one another. Continue in the word of God. Deny yourself. Love him more than anything else. And put your pride to death. And value him more than anything else. It's not an easy road, but it's the one that absolutely guarantees eternity in the presence of God. And it absolutely guarantees that the work of God will be done in your life. And it absolutely guarantees that what you've built and stored up is an eternal treasure in heaven. And that when the time comes that you do lay your eyes on God. Well done, good and faithful servant, is what he will say. This is my son. This is my daughter in whom I'm well pleased. This one has been a disciple who has followed in the discipline that my son laid out and accomplished my purpose. That's what we want. And this is how we get there. That's what I have for you tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you this evening for completing these five points. I thank you for getting me through them. I thank you for getting us through them. And I thank you, Lord, for showing us completely and totally what they mean and what they look like. I thank you for not pulling any punches. I thank you for giving us the whole picture of the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I thank you, Lord, that the ugly is what dies and doesn't stay with us. And I thank you that the good is what we find in doing your work and in doing your will, your way and your time, setting ourselves aside. Father, make us better disciples. Give us a desire to be better, not just better people, but better disciples of yours. Let us do your work in your time. Let us be led by your spirit. Accomplish what you would be accomplished or what you would have accomplished in our life. And may you get all the praise and all the glory for it. Keep us safe until you bring us back here again. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you so much for being here tonight, joining us tonight. I look forward to seeing you again very soon.